Hey, good morning, SRPC. Good morning. Good morning, morning, onlineers. Thanks for being with us today. Welcome to worship on, check it out, a beautiful, sunny Sunday morning. (laughs) How about that? What a gift. What a gift. Yeah. Hey, we are continuing a series that we began early on in the Lenten season called Why Did Jesus Die? And today we're going to be talking about really one of the hardest things that Jesus said about what it looks like to follow him. I have to confess, this was a hard sermon to write because it just hit so personally. And I I realized the gap between what Jesus says and the way I live. And so I'm going to invite you into my agony today. So how's that for for a prompt? And now you're ready for the sermon. Hey, we are so excited to welcome uh, Jeff Vanderweg here with us as our guest worship leader this Sunday. Thank you, Jeff. And I'm going to invite you to stand up. I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll join Jeff and our worship team in praising the Lord through song. God, thank you so much for the gift of this day. We thank you for your life in our midst and what that means for us. And we just ask that you would be present as we worship today, that we would sense that you're with us and that you want to speak to us. And so we offer our time, we offer ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship. Yeah. 
Bless the Lord of oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. the Lord of oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your
restlessness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. Praise the Lord. Let's keep on singing, but first let's, um, I don't know, the lyrics in that song are so strong. Um, bursting forth in glorious day. Oh my gosh, I can just see that. Lord, we thank you so much for bringing us here today. We know from that last song that it talks about that there are, there are things that we do that are that don't measure up to where you are, that, that don't measure up to the, um, to the aspirations that you have for us, that everyone, no matter who, always is, we are always going to fall short of what you want from us, what you hope for us, what you, what you expect from us, but what we can give you, Lord. And yet, we have your forgiveness you, you will never love us any less than you do right now. We thank you for your forgiveness that allows us to stand back up again and to recognize who you are and to praise you for who you are, Lord. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for, um, for helping us to fight against the sin that just encroaches on us. Help us to worship you. Help us to see you today in your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please um, stay standing as you can and let's keep on singing, Holy is the Lord. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy
Join me as we uh, listen for the Lord together this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you're already speaking. Lord, thank you for, I hope many of us, we've already heard, experienced something as we've worshipped together here. And Father, we pray you'd continue. Lord, as we um, hear through your word being preached, as we continue to sing, as we pray, as we fellowship together. Father, thank you that you desire to make yourself known to us in all sorts of wonderful ways, even just the sun shining this morning. Father God, I know that for many of us, if not all of us, there's areas we need to hear from you. We're seeking you in, Lord. Father, maybe this morning it's to hear from something that needs to change in our own hearts and lives. Father, I pray you be open to that and to be willing to surrender to you what you're tapping on our hearts, trusting that what you have for us is good. Lord, for some of us, Lord, there's just pain. There's some kind of hurt, pain, Father. We're just so needing a touch from you this morning. Maybe someone watching online. Father God, I just pray for, for, if nothing else, the reassurance that, yes, you're still there, God. And maybe even just a sweet touch of your healing in some way. Father, for some of us, we're wrestling with some kind of difficult decision. Lord, I pray even in that, Father, your guiding hand, your Holy Spirit, your breaking through. Thank you, Lord, that you bring us together in a unique way in worship. We're not only individually, but corporately, Father, we can hear you together. So, Lord, we welcome you here. Come move with your Holy Spirit this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you are shining, that your holiness is present. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to have a seat. Um, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's great to have you with us, whether you're online uh, watching or right here present in the room. And it was kind of weird getting out of the car and not feeling wetness 
Like, what happened? It's just like it disappeared all of a sudden, but it was wonderful to experience that. And hopefully we'll get a little bit more uh, spring-type weather. Um, as some of you were here last week, I had a blessing of getting away to a little tropical refreshment with some family last, last week. So God blessed me through that. So thank you. But as I wrote to someone else, I said, you know, it's also good to be back. And uh, this is a place that God has for me and, and for many of you. This is the work. This is the gift, the community that God calls us to. So honestly, that's, I was looking forward to that as well. This is a time that we uh, take time in our service to recognize our tithes and offerings, financial gifts uh, that we bring. And uh, first of all, it's a time just to say thank you. Thank you so much to many of you who give faithfully, generously, uh, over and over throughout the year. And uh, man, the blessings continue to unfold in the ministries and activities of this church and our worship together in many ways that happen during the week. So thank you so much. I came across this week one of the stranger parables we have in scripture. It's basically this parable about this, Jesus tells us, of this guy who's basically ripping off his boss. I mean, he says he's just, he's terrible. He's just wasting his boss's funds. Not the guy you want to hire. And then when he finds out his job's going to end, he does this weird stuff where he starts redoing the accounts of his boss's clients. The whole thing is messed up, and yet Jesus says, now I want you to learn something from this. And, and it's still, to be honest, kind of a weird one to learn from. But one of the things Jesus moves to is this point to look eternally. Look at the end. Where, why are we here? And how do we use the resources, the time, the gifts that God has given us? And he says this kind of strange thing. He talks about friends and he talks about eternity and being welcomed. And the idea seems to be in a sense that how we use the resources in our time here, we will see one day in heaven how that impacted so many others along our journey. And we will be welcomed by those people saying, thank you. Thank you. You didn't even know me. But your giving, your faithfulness made a difference. And so just a reminder that all of us are growing in our faith, but also growing, hopefully, in what we give out of ourselves. Our gifts and the spirit that God gives us, our resources, we have a limited time. How do we use those for the eternal, the long game, as you might say? So I want to pray for that as we go into our, um, just our offering time this morning, uh, that God would grow us all in that kind of way. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. Um, you challenge us, Lord, sometimes through parables that are difficult to comprehend. And yet, Lord, you remind us, Father, that our time here is short. And Lord, we've been given resources. We've been given gifts and uh, spiritual gifts. And if there are people here who don't know what that gift is, I pray, God, you would help them to discover and grow in that too. Father, I pray, Lord, for all of us that we would continue to grow in what it means to live a generous life. In the ways we love on one another, in the ways we use our resources, in the ways we use our time. Father, I pray not only individually, but as a community, we'd be known as a generous people. We would have the generous heart that you have, and it would never stop. That God, there would always be that opportunity to grow. And one day, Lord, we would see the bigger picture even more so. That God, you used us to build and move in kingdom purposes, and how many lives were touched through that. So, Father, thank you so much. Take these gifts that have been offered today, this week, and, and even this month for your glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we get an opportunity to extend our generosity to one another uh, by just saying hello to those who are around you. So we invite you to, to stretch for a moment. Say hello to somebody here in the congregation. If you're online, feel free to use the chat feature to say hello there, too. Okay, if I could uh, invite you to go ahead and
find your seat again. That would be great. Go ahead and grab a seat. Fun to hear all the chatter out there and hope those of you who are online use that chat bar. You know who's watching with you. Hey, let's, uh, let's reconnect around God's word, okay? If you can find your seat, that'd be great. Love it. This is the best part of the service right here. Wonderful. Hey, just a quick heads up as you get resettled. We always print a, a handout, an outline of the message so you have a sense of a roadmap where it's going. And uh, you can pick those up on the way in every Sunday morning. Please make use of that. We're in a series that we began uh, about five weeks ago now called Why Did Jesus Die? And we've been talking for these five weeks about the fact that, that there's so much more to Jesus' death on the cross than your ticket to heaven than my ticket to heaven. It's more than about getting us to heaven. In fact, Jesus at one point in his life said this, hey, you know, I've come, the reason I've come is to give you life, abundant life, life to the full, a life that's so much better than you ever even dreamed of. That's not a heaven life, that's a here life. Jesus came to give us that kind of life, and we'd probably all raise our hand and say, yes, I, I want that kind of life, but here's the interesting thing. The way to get that sort of life looks totally upside down than the way we usually pursue it. And we're going to talk about that this morning. But first, I want to take you back to what Jesus said about how his own life would go, what his own life would look like. You remember, we talked about this early on. Jesus gathered up with his disciples, his followers, and he said, hey, who do people say that I am? And they kind of weighed in on different opinions they'd heard about Jesus. And then he said, hey, but what about you guys? What, what, who do you say that I am? And Peter, who is often sort of the spokesperson for the disciples, chimes in. He goes, well, you know what? You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You are the one that we and all of Israel, the whole world, in fact, has been waiting for. And Jesus said, you got it. You're exactly right. Now, here's what we need to know. With that title, Christ, Messiah, came a sort of job description, right? If you've ever had a job, you have a job description. With that title came a job description. And in the people's minds and the people's hearts back in that day, that job description was all about power. It was all about authority. It was all about conquering. It was all about ruling the world. And what Jesus does in that moment with his closest followers is he flips the whole script, and he says, let me tell you what I'm about. Let me tell you the job description that I'm filling as the Messiah, the Christ, the one that the world has been waiting for. And we'll look at it again in Mark chapter 8. We'll put it on the screen for you. Jesus then began to teach them, the disciples, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. So here's what Jesus does in this moment with his followers. He accepts the title, but then he turns the job description upside down. He says the Messiah, the Christ, is not about power and about conquering. It's, he's about self-sacrifice and servanthood. Now we look at that and we go, oh, good for you, Jesus. I'm glad that's for you. It may not be my deal, right? But here's why this matters. You can't follow Jesus to this full and thriving life that Jesus promises we can have here and now if you don't go the same way. I can't follow Jesus to the full and thriving life he promises me here and now if I don't go the same way Jesus goes. It would be like this. If you and some friends of yours and family decided to take a trip to Disneyland, and so you, you had two separate cars, their family and your family, and you jump in the cars and you head out to Disneyland. You get to I-5, they go south toward Disneyland, you go north instead. And your last words to them in text as you're driving, you shouldn't do this, but some people do, you say, we'll see you in Disneyland. And you go north, they go south. Six hours later, they're standing in line at Disneyland, and you're in like weed, at a Chevron station, filling your tank, looking at Mount Shasta and going, like, is that the Matterhorn? I, 
I think that's the Matterhorn, right? You cannot get there going opposite directions. Here's what Jesus says. If you want the full and thriving life that I have for you, you have to follow me. You have to go the way I go. And so many of us go north to weed instead of south to Disneyland. And that's what Jesus is helping us understand. We have to go the way he goes. So how do we get to that life? Well, here's what Jesus talks about. And this is where the screws get tightened. And this happens right after the passage I read earlier uh, takes place. Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for me will find it. So according to Jesus, a full and thriving life is about, check this out, self-sacrifice and servanthood. That's how you get a full and thriving life in this world, here and now. Now, what I love about Jesus is he's so consistent and he's so straightforward. He does not pull punches. He doesn't bait and switch. He doesn't kind of tease you in with something good and then lay something difficult on you. He says, look, if you want the full and thriving life, it's got to look like mine. And that is a life of self-sacrifice and servanthood. Jesus talked about this in different ways in different places. In fact, in his most famous teaching, we call it the Sermon on the Mount in the Bible, here's what Jesus says. And he's teaching to crowds at this point, not just his, his buddies. He's teaching to crowds. And here's what he says. We'll put it on the screen for you. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. In other words, what Jesus says is very few people choose to live a life of servanthood and self-sacrifice. But that's where the life is. That's where it's thriving and vital and alive. Now, in our remaining time today, we're going to talk about this whole idea of an upside-down life and what it looks like according to Jesus. So here's what Jesus says. We're going to go back to Matthew. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple first must deny themselves. Okay, now that's a phrase that some of us, if if we've grown up or hung around church for a while, some of us sort of recognize and have an idea about what that looks like, right? Because we're in this season, this sort of pre-Easter season, we call in the church the season of Lent. And a lot of us start thinking about self-denial during Lent. We think about giving up things for Lent. Some of us might be giving up sugar for Lent. Some of us might be giving up meat for Lent. Some of us might be giving up alcohol or social media. We do those kinds of things at this time of year, and we think of it as self-denial. So when Jesus says, you've got to deny yourself, we think, oh, well, what should I give up? But I want us to know that Jesus is talking about something much, much different when he talks about self-denial. Denying myself in its truest sense, the way Jesus is talking about it, is saying no to putting myself on the throne. It's saying no to making me king of my life. Or another way to put it, it's saying no to making me God. That kind of decision is much bigger than giving up chocolate for Lent. It's saying no to making king, making me king. It's saying no to making me the God of my life. And that's much bigger. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Now, we have a bent. We just need to know this about ourselves. We have this bent toward making ourselves God. To making ourselves the one who's large and in charge of our life. And this bent goes all the way back to the very beginning of creation. And if you know the Bible, you know the story in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, where Adam and Eve are in the garden. They've got this awesome relationship with God, but there's a serpent there. There's a tempter there. And the tempter says to them, hey, you know what? That, that fruit looks pretty good. And, and Adam and Eve agree. 
And, and Eve says, you know, but here's the deal. We can't eat that fruit because God said if we eat it, we're going to die. And here's what the tempter, here's what the serpent says. I'll put it on the screen. He says, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat it, when you eat from it, your eyes will be open. Check this out. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Oh, here's my chance. I get to be king of my life. I get to, and you know the story, right? They eat the fruit. Now, they didn't die physically after they ate it, right? What died was their relationship with God. They essentially made themselves God. They put themselves in the place of God, and the world got bad really quick. You and I, that's our story. Whenever we put ourselves as God, put ourselves on the throne, things begin to unravel. And it happens, listen, it happens in a thousand small and big ways in life. We make ourselves God, and things don't go the way we ought. We miss the good life. We miss that, that thriving life that Jesus promises. We try to make ourselves God. We try to put ourselves in charge. And we do it in a thousand small and big ways. We do it when we cut people off on the road and when we cut people off in conversation because we want to tell our story. We do it when we buy things that we don't need and when we pass by people in need. There's a thousand big and small ways that we assert ourselves as the God of our lives. Our bent is always toward putting ourselves on the throne, making ourselves in charge, making ourselves God. And self-denial, the kind that Jesus is talking about, is living upside down. It's saying no to the God who is me. And it's trading our selfish life for the sacrificial and serving life that Jesus lived and trusting it's a better life than a life with us in charge. Now, that's a big swap. That's a big gamble. That's a high risk. But Jesus says at the end of that is life that you have never even imagined. Jesus goes on. It's not just about denying yourself. Jesus continued, whoever wants to be my disciple must take up their cross and follow me. Now, to understand the impact of those words, we have to understand what people thought of the cross back in Jesus' day. See, back in Jesus' day, people didn't wear necklaces that were crosses. That wasn't a thing. The cross in Jesus' day, listen, was a grotesque instrument refined by the Roman Empire as, as an instrument of torture and death. And they were good at it. They were very good at it. And at the time of Jesus, the only reason anyone would ever touch or take up a cross was if you had been sentenced to death by Rome. It was the last thing you did before you die. You pick up your cross and then you go die. A torturous, gruesome, horrific death. Now, we wear crosses as necklaces. I have a beautiful cross behind me. And while it's true today that the cross reminds us of Jesus' love, it's also a statement, according to Jesus, not me, according to Jesus, about how we're supposed to live. A life of total surrender, a life of death to ourselves, a life of self-sacrifice and servant, servanthood. Now, from time to time, we see people in the Bible who really, who lock into this and get it, they understand it. And one person, his name was the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, <laughs> in this letter he wrote to Philipp, this church in, in Philippi, we call it the letter of Philippians, he goes on this rant in Philippians 3 about all the things that he's accomplished, how great he is. And then he hits this moment, he says, but I want to tell you what happened when I met Jesus. I want to tell you what happened when I flipped the script, when I picked up my cross, so to speak. Here's the, the reorientation of my life. I'll read it in verses 7 and 8 of Philippians chapter 3. Paul writes this, whatever were gains to me, all the stuff he did, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. 
What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. I'm going to keep reading, but we don't have it on the screen. Verse 10. I want to, this is what Paul says, I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know the power of his resurrection. Check this out. And participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. See, Paul gets it. He gets it. He says, I got all this stuff that I've accomplished in life, and I'm going to set it aside because what I've discovered is when I die to myself, when I pick up my cross, that's where the life is. That's the life I want. And this is so counterintuitive. It's so different than the way that we live. But to take up your cross is to say, I'm willing to trade or surrender any and all success I have for the sake of knowing Jesus. That's where real life, that's where a full and thriving life is found. Now, Jesus finishes by saying this, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. You know, those words spoken a couple thousand years ago show us that Jesus gets us. Because if you think about it today, here's what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying to his disciples 2,000 years ago, and what he's saying to us today is this. You chase after all kinds of things, trying to find life, trying to build your life, trying to hold on to your life, and that chase is killing you. It's killing you. And the truth is this, that when you trust me with your life, And when you live like I lived, you will find a life more robust and full than you've ever believed you could have. The whole script gets flipped. No more chasing, much more trusting. So a couple weeks ago, I'm in a group that meets once a month and part of our time together in this small group is to go off for about 45 minutes and just do some reflecting. And we meet at Crosswinds Church down in Livermore, that one that's right adjacent to the freeway, kind of a farm setting. It's a beautiful setting. And so we were sent out for about 45 minutes to do some reflecting. And the prompt was this. The prompt was about asking God what he's saying to us about slowing our lives down. And so I went out there. And I sat down on this bench overlooking the freeway. This is like 4.30 on a Thursday afternoon, and I'm looking at 5.80 east and west, and it is a madhouse. And I'm like, what is God trying to say to me here about slowing down? And it became for me a visual metaphor of the chase that I go after in life. It's a chase, it's a race to find life, to build life, to hold on to life. And that's my life like this. And I'll bet you in so many ways, that's your life. Because that's what we do here. That's how we live here, right? So I'm sitting there. I'm looking at this and going, oh, my gosh, that's my life. I'm supposed to slow. I look across the freeway, and there's this beautiful hill. It's like a ranch. And on this hill are sheep. And the sheep are grazing on this hill. Like right side by side of the freeway where everything's going like crazy. And these sheep are grazing, and it became for me, again, another visual metaphor. This this idea that right in the midst of all this craziness, you can actually pull away and have a completely different life, a life of total trust in God's provision and in God's love, the kind of life that Jesus invites us to, the kind of life that Jesus invites me to. It was awesome, and it was hard, and I'm still working on it. What about you? What can you do, what can I do today or this week to to begin to move toward that kind of life that Jesus is talking about? What What are the life signs 
that point us toward that life. Let me just share with you a, a few. The first thing is this. I think there's a posture of openness that we have to have to God. To invite God to show us where is it that I'm chasing, that I'm racing, and in doing that, the life is being sucked out of me. Where am I chasing and racing? The psalmist in the Old Testament invites God to do that all the time. But here's what Psalm 139 says. We'll put it on the screen. Search me, God. This invitation, right? Openness to God. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. Where am I chasing and racing? See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God, I want a different life than the life of chasing and racing. Show it to me, please. You can do that today. You can do that this week and have an openness to God. Show you what's going on in you. Second, you can make a habit of ending your day by looking back at your day and asking, hey, how did I do at self-sacrifice today? How did I do at servanthood today? How did I put others first? What opportunities did I miss? Because when you reflect on your day, when you pay attention to your life a day at a time, it helps you become more like Jesus. At the end of the day, you can look back at your day and ask those kinds of questions. Third, Ask God to show you a place or a people that you can give your time and your heart to. Ask God to show you somewhere or someone you can serve and live a little more sacrificially for. Because that, Jesus says, that's where life is. Now, I told you at the beginning of the service today, it's so hard. I mean, for me, it's so hard, I think, for all of us because it seems so upside down. That's just not the way we do life, is it? But would you join me and just for a week trust Jesus on this one and see what happens? Let's pray. If you feel comfortable, just as you're Sitting there, just open your hands onto your lap. Let's talk to God for a minute. God, life is so often about chasing and racing after things that we think matter. And we call it life, but it sucks the life out of us. Jesus, thank you for living an upside down life and calling us to do that too. Would you help us know what that looks like for us? God, so many times we're like those cars on the freeway, just racing back and forth, building and grasping, holding on to life, at least the life we think is life. Help us to pasture ourselves in your goodness and your faithfulness. And in doing that, be able to live a life that looks more like you, Jesus. God, that's a tall order. That's hard. So we ask for your grace on the journey and your strength to do it just one day at a time this week. And would you show us in doing that the life that is truly life? We pray it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for those words for us to really, really ponder and see if we could live into like the challenge for this week. I would encourage you to stand as we uh, continue in worship as you're able. Um, we've talked about standing a lot so far today. Uh, in the last song we sang, I, um, we stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We're going to talk about standing again now. And this is a different kind of standing. It's a, it's like standing for Jesus. What do you stand for? Um, the picture that I get is um, from the book of Daniel when it talks about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You must bow down to the king. And they decided, no, nope, 
not going to do that. And it was terribly obvious that they weren't doing that because they looked around and everybody was bowing down and they were standing. I don't know if they were kind of like this or if they were like this or what they were doing, but they were standing and they were standing, no, no, God is my king. I will bow to him. I will not bow to anybody else. And um, maybe that's part of what you're talking about, Mark, about Jesus is asking us to stand for him. That's one of the things. It's not easy sometimes. Sometimes it is. It's great in church to stand and raise up our hands and all that where we're among believers. But then do you stand and, and raise your hands and stuff when you're out shopping or, you know, dropping kids off somewhere or going to a friend's house for dinner or something like that? I don't know. Maybe. If you are, praise God. If not, something to think about. Let's sing.
can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Jeff, for leading us this morning in worship team. And Matthew senior in high school with us. Thank you so much for you guys joining us. Yeah. As you leave today, you're going to have some friendly people holding baskets. It's our Deacon's Fund Collection Sunday. We do it at the end of each month. And uh, this is a special emergency fund um, that some of you have benefited from. For people in our congregation who have a need um, that we can help with and sometimes from our local community. So if you'd like to contribute to that, feel free. And also as a reminder, if you don't have something to give on a Sunday morning for that and digital works better for you, there's always an option online to give to that fund. There's a if you drop down list that says deacons. If you're online, obviously that might be better for you. So just know about that as well. Hey, at 1015 today, we have donuts and debrief. Pastor Mark will be downstairs in the classroom there. If you'd like to hear more about what we talked about this morning, you have questions. It's about 45 minutes, and we have some refreshments down there, too. So feel free to join us uh, for that as well. Um, also, as you leave today, uh, we have an opportunity to participate in an upcoming event. It's a children's event. We're going to do the Saturday before Easter out here in the uh, entryway area, and we're calling it Exceptional Event. Oh, and we also have Shepherd's Gate Easter baskets. That's nice to know as well. Um, that, you can bring that back next Sunday. Uh, and then on Saturday, uh, not this Saturday, but the following after, we'll have this special children's event. Feel free to volunteer for that. We could use help for that. Um, but also, uh, we could um, use Easter eggs. So as you go today, we are looking for about eight families or people to put together about 50 5 Easter eggs stuffed with some candy and some um, maybe some fun things in there. I think stickers they're going to do. So Courtney will be out there. If you want to help with that and you bring them back next Sunday, 50 eggs, that would be awesome. And there's going to be a little Easter egg hunt, as you can probably figure that's happening uh, coming up. Hey, and then uh, next Sunday begins Holy Week. And this is the week we remember, reflect, experience once again what Jesus did for us in that final week as he was going to the cross and the resurrection. So it starts off next Sunday, Palm Sunday. We'll start the same normal time, 9 o'clock right here. And then Thursday of that week, we're going to have a Monday Thursday service that we're going to share with our friends here at Christ Community Church right here in this room. 7 o'clock, this is the time we remember the last supper that Jesus had with his disciples. And just beautiful event. We'll have communion at that event. Good Friday, we're going to join our friends over at Community Presbyterian Church for their 1230 service. Um, so if you're able to get away midday, come over there and join us. Um, that'll be a great thing. Easter Sunday, uh, we've got two things happening that day. First of all, for those who want to rise with the sun, we're going to have a sunrise service right out here at 630. We're going to watch the sunrise together. It'll be a short uh, half-hour service we're going to share with Christ Community Church. And then right after that, we're going to have a little breakfast. Christ Community Church is going to put on a breakfast at 7 o'clock if you'd like to be there for that. And then come back at 8.30 or stay till then. We are going to do a half hour earlier for our main service uh, we've got three churches sharing this campus, a lot of activities, so to kind of space it out a little bit, we're going to begin a half hour earlier at 8.30. You'll hear more about that, but special week coming up. And Pastor Mark, yeah. thanks for your word this morning. <laughs> Absolutely. You must have known the announcements were long because he didn't even come up until the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, I'll wait till he's done. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, brother. You, know, you bet. Thank you. And, and again, thank you, Jeff, Matthew, <laughs> worship team. So good to, to worship under your leadership today. Hey, I was just thinking as we were wrapping up today about this whole invitation to, that Jesus offers to follow him, to follow him to a life of servanthood and sacrifice. And actually, it seems crazy, but it's, he's going to Disneyland, and it's great. Don't go to weed. <laughs> Amen? Amen. All right, have a good week. We'll see you soon.